Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here with all of you. And uh, for those of you who were here in previous weeks, welcome back. For those of you who are new here, welcome. This is the Musar Podcast uh, coming live to you here from Houston, Texas. That's for these people listening online. And um, we're going to continue where we left off last week. Um, before we do, you'll cut this, please. Um, before we, we go further, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that this class is available on podcast, on Google, on Apple, on Overcast, on Breaker, on whatever other pa- podcast platform you're familiar with. Uh, they're available all online, on also on uh, um, TuneIn. I added it, okay. right? So it's on TuneIn as well. It's on all of these different uh platforms apple podcast is probably the most it is by far the most popular so, to get up a few days um we have to edit out the questions and the noise and the background and all that so if you haven't signed in yet here's the i'm passing around the orange envelope if you can please sign in uh, if you haven't or that one that document is also fine okay we're going to begin now okay So we left off last week talking about the importance of understanding criticism, accepting criticism, and being appropriate with giving criticism and ensuring that the person who receives that criticism, uh, that we're giving it with the best intention, with love, and that they're willing to accept. If someone is not willing to accept, you're not allowed to give them that criticism. You're not allowed to say a word if they're not willing to accept it. Right? So how do you know? Well, you have to get to know that individual. Okay. So I want to talk now about something which is very, very critically important about Musser growth. And this is probably the most important thing we will talk about in all of our classes going forward. Okay. The most important piece of information you will hear in this class is the following. And that is that in order to grow, you must take small steps. In order to grow, you must take small steps. I can't emphasize this enough. If you do not take small steps, you're bound to fail. How many times have I heard from people or have I tried myself and said, you know what, I'm never going to speak Lashon Hara again. I'm never going to speak slander about someone else again. Or I'm always going to, or I'm never going to, or any of those statements that, that, that follow. It is unbelievable how challenging it becomes when we try to jump too high. When we try, you know, we're going to cut here a second. Um, is it possible if you move in a second, just a little bit? Move in so we can close the door behind you. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. And I want to tell you an amazing, amazing idea from the tabernacle. Now, we're all familiar that the the Jewish Jewish people have in Jerusalem something called the Western Wall, the Kotel. What is that Western Wall? That's the Western Wall of the Temple. It's the only remaining wall, standing wall, of the original Temple that we had in Jerusalem. And God willing, God will bless us that we will have it rebuilt. The third temple would be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Amen. And what's so special about that temple? What was there? This is very interesting. First is, you had 15 steps leading up to the public courtyard, uh, leading from the public courtyard all the way to the area that was designated for the, where the offerings with the Kohanim went only. Those 15 steps our sages tell us, symbolize that when a Jew grows, <clears throat> when a Jew grows, we need to take small steps. But then when you walk in, you see something very odd. And if you look at any of the pictures of the temple, you'll notice something very, very odd. Is that it, it has one feature that is perpendicular to the entire setting. And that is the ramp and the altar. You see, it's narrow and long, the temple. And yet you had perpendicular 
in a perpendicular direction, you had the, the long ramp and the altar. And if any picture you look at the temp of the temple, you'll see this, you know, uh, like a long area, right? Narrow-ish. And then inside that narrowish, you have you have like almost taking the entire width of it is the length of the altar and the and the ramp. And you wonder like why is it so emphasized like that? I mean, I think we have great great engineers in the Jewish people. We can come up with a nice spiral staircase. We can come up with other other mechanisms that we don't have to have this long ramp taking over the whole space of the temple. So I would like to share with you an idea. What is a ramp? A ramp is something very special because it has two special functions. Number one is that, you know, anyone here go on vacation? I'm sure you all went on vacation. You go on vacation and try this next time you go, and you'll see it's amazing. It's a miracle. It'll work. I'm a magician. I can tell you. It'll work, okay? Take a ball and secure it on your steps, okay? Or secure it on the step, okay? So it's secured. Okay, it's not rolling down. And then gently walk away from it and then go out the door, lock the door, and go on your vacation. And when you come back, where's that ball going to be? Exactly where you left it. Because it's very easy to stagnate on a step. But try that on a ramp. Take that ball, put it on a ramp, go on your vacation. Where's that ball going to be? That at the bottom. On a ramp, you cannot stagnate. It's impossible to stagnate on a ramp. You're either going up or you're going down. And that's the first symbolism that we see in the, in the temple, is that you need to either be going up or you need to be going down. You can't do nothing. You can't stand in one place. And if you remember the first class we spoke about, I told you this, I'm just going to reiterate it quickly, is that I firmly don't believe in orthodoxy in Reform Judaism, in Conservative Judaism, in Reconstructionist Judaism. I don't believe in any of that. I think all of those labels are totally nonsense. I believe there are two types of Jews. There are growing Jews and stagnant Jews. And this ramp symbolizes that. You're either growing or you're, or you're descending, essentially. You can't stagnate, really. You're either going up or you're going down. But there's something even more amazing about the ramp. You see, what are steers? Um, sadly, many of us had to rebuild our homes or our outreach centers or our synagogues uh, after the last flood, Hurricane Harvey. And um, many of us had to have new stairwells, staircases installed in our homes. Right? So you know how they, how they built staircases? It's pre-engineered. Right? It's about six and a half inches between each step, and it is exact. In fact, they tried, they did a a um, a uh, study, and you can find this video on YouTube, I'm sure. But they did a study. They went in in a uh, in a uh, subway station in New York City, and they added a half an inch or less than a half an inch to one step, and everybody fell. Everybody fell. You know, you're used to having a six and a half inches, and then one was seven inches. Boom, everyone fell. Okay, that's pre-engineered. Pre-engineered, this is the size step that most people take, and this is the way, you know, this is the height that you need to grow to get to the next step, to the next step. But in Judaism, we don't believe in pre-engineered spiritual growth. Everyone must take their own size step, and that's why we have a ramp. The ramp symbolizes that you take the step that's right for you. You don't grow like someone else. Oh, well, my neighbor started... Um, observing Shabbat, so maybe I should do that. Well, maybe that's not where you're holding yet. Maybe you, you have something else that you should do before that. Um, my, my neighbor is giving away 50% uh, of their money to charity. Does that mean that you're capable of doing that? No. So uh, you have to understand that just because someone else does something or just because you're inspired doesn't mean that you're ready to take that, that, that next step. And it's very important to remember that Judaism is represented through that ramp where every person, you know, it's interesting. My almost two-year-old daughter, if she went on the six and a half inch step, she wouldn't be able to climb up because it's too big of a climb for her. And if you have someone who's of older age, 
right? They might not be able to raise their leg up six and a half inches. So in essence, uh, that staircase could be discriminating against some people. It could be discriminating, right? Because some people are not, it's not going to be good for them. That in Judaism, we believe that every person must take their, their own size step. There's no pre-engineered spiritual growth in Judaism. You take your own size step. Now, there's another very important thing. You know, I went, um, I went uh, back in May. I, I took a group from Houston. We went to Kentucky. And we went to, we did the Bourbon Trail. And part of this whole trip, we went hiking. And I was, I was younger than most of the people there. And uh, I thought, I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm this young whippersnapper. I'm going to be uh, hiking, and I'm going to be able to do the trail faster. And I realized something very, very uh, insightful. And that is that on these big trails, on these steep trails, if you try to run, you're going to fall all the way down, like down the whole cliff. you got to be very careful. You need to make sure that before you take your next step, that your previous step is firm. It's secure. It's ready to go. Now you can take your next step. That foot is, fir- is firm and secure. You take your next, ste- next step because you can slip on one leaf and you're all the way down and you lose everything. Potentially being life-threatening. Spiritually, it's exactly the same thing. Spiritually, if we don't secure our footing before we take the next step, we're at danger of losing Everything we have spiritually. How many people I can tell you about that said, Rabbi, I was on my, st- I'm on my path to, to Jewish growth and it was too much and now I'm done. Out. Yarmulke off. Everything off. Goodbye. I'm done. Because if you take too much of a step, you try to climb too fast, you fall down that cliff and then you say, what do I have left? It's very dangerous. We have to be so careful. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, to introduce a concept to you, but um, I had a woman who once came. She's been coming to my classes now for over 12 years. She's been coming on a regular basis to my class, and one day she says to me, she says, Rabbi, I'm ready. You tell me what to do. I'm ready. I'm ready to change my life, to be a, 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 a Jew who's growing. I'm ready to do this. You tell me what to do. I'm ready to keep Shabbos. I'm ready to keep kosher. Just tell me what to do. Give me that, that prescription. Give it to me, and it's done. So you know what I told her? I told her, I want you to take one light switch in your house, one light switch, and take a piece of tape and cover that light switch. One light switch. And call it your Shabbos light. And she looks at me. She says, Rabbi, that's nothing. I said, great. Then that's what you should do. When it's nothing and it's so easy, that's a perfect step for you. It's just nothing. But if it's something which is difficult, well, I'll see if I can, if I can't, da, 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 it's all, we'll, never, we'll never succeed. And she took that nothing, and I said, come back to me when, you're, when it's easy already for you, and it's, you don't even have to think about it. She came to, back to me a few weeks later. She says, Rabbi, it's like second nature. Every Friday, I prepare that light switch. That one light switch doesn't go on or off the whole Shabbat. I, she said, now what do I do? I said, now take another light switch. Right? Long story short, it's taken some time. But it brought her to a point of complete Shabbat connection, con- complete Shabbat observance because of one light switch and another light switch and another light switch. And it changes your life. Right? We think, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to never go to the cleaners anymore on Shabbat right? because it's not really what I need to do on Shabbat. I'm not going to do that on Shabbat. Or I'm never going to drive on Shabbat. No, that, that, don't jump. One step. We all, we're all here for one reason, right? Because we want to grow, right? But what's the correct path to growth? Not jumping. You jump, you fall, you break your leg. Spiritually. And it doesn't work. I want to share with you the most incredible story. My grandfather, of blessed memory, uh, was a big rabbi. And he was asked by the Israeli army during the Yom Kippur War to travel out to Sinai 
and to speak to all the officers and the, and the, and the commanders who are out in the field to inspire them, to give them some spiritual guidance, to uplift them. So my grandfather is on this military aircraft, and during the flight, my grandfather looks out the window, and he sees that they're flying right over the houses. Like right, it's like flying. So my grandfather asks, is everything okay with the engines? I mean, we're flying really low, like 100 feet over the ground. Like it's really low. So they say, yeah, it's no problem. So why are you flying so low? He said, because there are something called radars. And the radars detect anything flying above it. But if you fly below the radar, they don't detect you. So my grandfather said, that's the Yetzahara. When we fly high and we say, oh, I'm never going to talk Lashon Hara. We're flying high. The Yetzahara is our radar. He detects us. He shoots us right down. You fly beneath the radar. It's just one light switch. The Yetzahara says, I've got bigger fish to fry, right? I have, it's like the police officers, right? When they're, when they're having a speed trap, right? You're going two miles over the speed limit. I, I want that, 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 that Chazer who says, you know, he's, he's driving 25 miles over the speed limit. I'm going to get that guy. Right? That's the Yetzahara. He says, I you know, you're taking something so small. You're saying, you know what? Between 8.30 and 8.45 in the morning, I'm not going to be arrogant. I'm not going to talk about my neighbor. I'm not going to be jealous. Just in those 15 minutes. The Yetzirah says, ah, oh, come on. That's no big deal. I'm not, I'm not going to waste my resources on that. I'm going to find someone who says, I'm never going to be arrogant again. I'm never going to be jealous again. The person who says, I'm never... And that's why the Chafetz Chaim tells us this. The Chafetz Chaim, who taught us about the laws of Lashon Hara and made it so uh, well known in the world, passed away in 1934, not so many years ago. Right? The great Chafetz Chaim lived in the city of Radin. And he said that the way we need to trick our Yetzirah not to attack us when we accept something upon ourselves is to say, you know what, between 9 and 10, find some time during the day, which is an easy time, between 9 and 10 in the morning, I'm not going to talk about anybody else. Just one hour. That's it. One hour. And I know many people who have the, an alarm on their watch right, or on their, on their phone that between 9 and 10, they don't talk about other people. So someone comes up to them, hey, did you hear about Charlie? Uh, I'm sorry. Tell me after 10 o'clock. <laughs> right? but, and, and usually you should know that if you do that, you do that, you, they won't end up telling you because, you know, it, it's just the excitement of that moment that you know someone wants to share with you that that negative information, that slander about someone else. You know, between nine and ten is my is my hour. You say, you know, listen, don't talk to me, Lashon Hara. Okay, let me hear. Is it good? <laughs> it's like it, it's very easy for it to fall apart. Small steps is the key to our success in all of our work. And you'll see that we're going to talk about this a lot. We're going to talk about taking small steps, whether it comes to any of those traits we discussed previously. It's going to be kindness. It's going to be arrogance. It's going to be a jealousy. It's going to be, uh, um, you know, just any of the traits that we talked about um, previously, if we have that list, we, we have that list here, right? Um, love. Humility, happiness, generosity, faith, cleanliness, caring, appreciation, patience, truth, will. These are all positive traits. You're going to try to take them all and change your life in one day? It's, not, it's never going to work. You do a small change and another small change and another small change. It can take years to acquire a trait to its perfection. But it's worth it because every little move on that on that compass changes our entire direction of our life. And that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to change. Be a different person. We're not trying to be perfect. Right? The Mishnah in Ethics of Our Fathers, chapter two, Mishnah fifteen or sixteen, says, Lo Alecha Hamlacha Ligmor, your job is not to be perfect. That's not your job. But you're not allowed to stop pursuing perfection. Our goal is to pursue perfection. That's our, that's our ambition. That's our desire. We want to attain perfection. But you know what? That's our desire. We're not obligated to, to get there. We have to try and put our effort forward, put our best foot forward, 
and hopefully we'll be successful with that. Now, any questions about that? Any questions about small steps? Go for it, Jay. Great question. The pursuit of perfection needs to be our life's goal. That needs to be our life's goal. You see, everyone is created with a neshama, with a soul. And that soul has, well, you know, it's interesting. We're going to call it, we're going to talk a lot about, I'm going to introduce you to a new word. It's called midot or mida. It's singular. Midot is plural. And it means trait or traits. And it, it, if, what's that? Qualities are the positive traits. You have negative traits as well. So you have these traits. Now, why is it called midot? Midot really means measurements. Why is it called measurements when we're referring to your traits? The reason is, you ever walk into a science lab and, you, and you're wondering, like, um, they have the purple chemical this much, the yellow chemical this much, the red chemical this much, the yellow chemical, right? All of these different colors, all these different, and all these different amounts, and you look and say, like, what's this? I have no idea what this is. This is I guess some science lab, right? And I'm not a science guy, so I have no idea what it is. Well, basically, those are our traits. Each one of us here have a different quantity of traits, meaning we take the trait of kindness. Well, who here is a 10 in kindness? Well, we all aspire to be a 10 in kindness, but maybe I'm a five, maybe I'm a two, maybe I'm a nine, and I just need to perfect it. And there's a whole process to reaching that perfection. So our life's goal is to reach perfection in all those traits. Now, hopefully we have enough time. Hopefully we have enough wisdom and inspiration to get there. But that's our, the reason we're living life every day is to reach that perfection. We want to be God-like. I mentioned this earlier. We're Adam. We're called Adam, mankind, because of the word Adame, because we want to be God-like. God is perfect in all his traits, and we aspire to be perfect like God, to emulate God with our traits. So that needs to be our lifelong desire and goal is to reach perfection. Now, are we going to attain it? Well, hopefully we will. But, and our goal is not right now. Right now is just to take a step. Right now, I take a step. You know, it's like, think of a company. A company wants to change their, their, their outlook for the, for the coming year, how many sales they're going to make. Do they change that, like, right now? Like, are we going to change the sales projection right now? We're going we to change the projection, but are they, is the outcome going to change right now? No. We have a whole 12 months to make that change happen. And what are we going to do the first month? Well, we're going to make a few sales uh, specials. We're going to change a few products, right? It, it's small adjustments that hopefully put us on a trajectory of, of perfection. But it doesn't work. It, first, is there's no autopilot in spirituality. And this isn't a quick fix self-help program. This is a lifelong endeavor of attaining. And I've had so many stories over the years of people who have participated in these Musa classes in various different locations throughout Houston. Uh, and they've told me that it put them on a, on a system of growth, on a path of growth. It put them on that road. And sometimes we have these traits and we're like, eh, I I'm pretty good with that, right? And then we start learning about it and they're like, whoa, I didn't realize it was that it was that intense or that complex or that detailed. And I'll give you, we're going to do this before every trait we're going to talk about. I'm going to go around the room here. I'm going to say, okay, you know, the trait of kindness. What do you think the trait of kindness? So we're going to go around the room. Everyone's going to give their idea of what kindness is. And you'll see that when we actually learn through it, it'll be, it's like a totally different world of what kindness is. It's a totally different world. Not that our concepts are wrong. But we're going to take with the Torah's idea of how we attain kindness and, and use it with our perspective that we have already and hopefully uh, mesh the two and, and bring inspiration to our day-to-day -day kindness. Yes? Yes. 
No, Adon means master. Um, but it's not, it's not a word to, no, I mean, maybe somewhere in the root you can find the, the Aleph Dalad of Adam and Adon. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Hashem is our father. Hashem loves us. Hashem gives us everything we have. What it does. It, no, it should be it should be humility. It's very humbling. Imagine God created the entire world and he cares about us. He cares about every single individual to make sure that we have the food to eat and we have the the the, the job to go to. Everything that we have in our life is being um stitched by God, you know, hand stitched. So God says, oh, I'm going to change the stitching here. You're going to make a right over here. You're going to lose your job, but I'm going to open up a new channel for you. It's going to open up new doorways, new, a whole new life. That's that's God in, intervening in our day-to-day -day life to make it perfect for us. Any other questions before we continue? You good? Are you okay with this? Yeah. Okay. I'm struggling a little bit with with at the end of your life. You know, once you once you reach the crest, who you are as a person once you reach those two crests. No, 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 no. Why? I'm struggling with that. Okay, so um, this is why we're here. Okay, so let's imagine this. Okay, Can, how can someone call themselves a doctor? Isn't that arrogant? Oh, you're a doctor. Right, you finished all. Yeah, I worked very hard to get there. Right, so I'm a doctor, and if you try to call them Mister or, or Mrs., right, good luck. Right, and then I'm treating you again. Right, what do you mean? They worked very hard for it. Right now, I don't know anyone who reaches perfection and says, "Oh, by the way, I'm perfect." I don't know anyone like that. My grandfather, who, according to most p opinions, was a perfect man you know, after working on himself for 40, 50, 60 years of really every single day toiling on his character. And, and, and he writes, I mean, his book that he writes, and I, I learn his book every single week with a study partner. We study it. It's more of an autobiography of his whole struggle. And, you know, talking about every single trait that he struggled with. And how the, the steps that he took to overcome them. Now, he doesn't write it in that form. Well, I tried this, I tried that. He writes it in a very eloquent, uh, in a beautiful, beautiful way. But um, it's, it's a system of taking each one of our traits, first is identifying them, and then taking one at a time. Don't try to change them all. You take one trait at a time, and you work on it. And you work on it, and you work on it till you reach perfection, and then you go to the next trait, and you take the next one. Now, we all have positive traits, and we all have negative traits. My grandfather said this. I heard it probably, I don't know, maybe several dozen times, where he said, "If you don't know your negative traits, it's terrible. But if you don't know your positive traits," He would say this in Hebrew, Oy vavoy, right? Woe to you, right? You must know your positive traits. And it's very easy for us. I'm sure all of you are thinking in the back of your head, well, I know my negative traits. Yeah, I know them pretty well, right? Or I don't realize all of them, but I know some of them really well. Positive traits? Me? I can't think of any. I, I don't know. Like, and we would always ask him, is it arrogance for me to say, you know, I'm good at this trait? He says, no, it's not arrogance. It's an obligation. You have to know what your positive trait is. You have to get to know yourself. And this is really a self-discovery class. It's not self-help. It's self-discovery. When I know where I'm at with my own kindness or with any of those other traits, now I know what I can work on. It's empowering. It doesn't weak, weaken us to, oh, I can't believe it. I'm only a four in kindness. You know what? I'm a four in kindness. Right? I got so much more to go. I'm excited about this. I'm energized. I can change. I can change the world with that kindness. You know what? Think for a second, okay? Has anybody here heard of the Susan uh, Komen Foundation, right? Everybody's heard of it. You know who else has heard of it? 
every football player, every baseball player, every basketball player, and every person going to those games. You know why? Because one person thought, I can stop breast cancer. One person. And I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah. You, you think you're really going to get football players to wear pink? Right? Yeah, you really think that's going to happen? They're going to wink. They're going to have pink towels and pink uh, 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 sneakers and pink right helmets. You really think it's going to happen? Yes. These are the macho guys. You think they're going to wear pink for Susan Coleman Foundation? Yes. But this person says, I'm not going to do it today. I'll take one step and another step and another step. And that changes the world. I, I, I find so much inspiration in that. And every time I see these players with the pink, in the Major League Baseball, they're hitting with pink bats for breast cancer awareness. Someone's changing the world. So every one of us can do that. We can do it with something unique. We don't have to be a Susan Coleman. Right? We don't have to have this big foundation. But we can change with one thing, and I can give you hundreds of stories of people who've changed their entire world around them because they changed one thing. One thing. It's, it, it's, an, it's an amazing world we're living in, and we have amazing opportunity to to influence this change. But we're not trying to change the world. We're trying to change ourselves. By changing ourselves, we're changing the world. So, understanding... Any other questions? Understanding our midot and our traits. Where do our traits come from? So, our traits come from God. It says in Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, it says, Vayipach be'apav nishmat chaim. When God created Adam, he blew into his nostrils a living soul. Our sages tell us, you know what a living soul means? Of course, we can breathe. Our soul enters our body through our nose. It leaves our body through our nose. But more than just a living soul, we got traits. God is perfect in all his traits. We're not perfect. We're not God. Till we're not God, we're not going to be perfect unless we work and work and work and work and work on those traits. So we got pieces of that, of that godliness. We got pieces of those traits. We all have traits that are good. We all have traits that are not good. And we need to work on them. Okay? The attributes of God, mercy, kindness, forgiveness etc., all of the 13 attributes, right? The 13 main principles of attributes. But we have those traits too. We have those traits. Now, God has them in perfection. We don't. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to emulate God and become perfect in those traits. We mentioned that amida means a measurement. We have different measurements. That's where we're, the, our, our humanity has midot, has traits, and they're different quantities. Right? Everyone has a different quantity. You go around this table, there's no one who's the same composition of traits. No one. We all have different a different composition of traits. Now, our sages tell us that every single person has a single trait that's perfect. We all have that number one trait that's the top of our mountain that's perfect. We have to identify that trait. What is that trait? Everyone has one. Imagine, God gave you one trait, and it's important to identify that trait because once you identify that trait, that is going to be your anchor that will help you fix the rest of your traits. Right? That's, you're going to use that trait. So if it's a trait of kindness, if it's a trait of faith, it's a trait of, of, of uh, generosity, you're going to use that as an anchor to pull up the rest of your traits. So your negative traits, your other positive traits that need uplifting, you're going to use that trait to help them grow. And it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, experience when you're able to use your trait. First is identifying that trait. <coughs> Excuse me. Identifying that trait is critical. And it's so empowering. 
that if one is able to identify what that perfect trait is, it's suddenly you realize like, wow, I have such an amazing gift. This is me. My grandfather would tell his students to go and take a walk at night alone. They lived, the, the yeshiva that my grandfather had was in a little village called Be'er Yaakov, which is outside of Rehovot and uh, near Tel Aviv, about 15 minutes from Tel Aviv. It was a very quiet suburb. And he would tell the students to go out at night and to go for a walk and introspect, get to know yourself. And one night, one of the students came back, and he's white like a ghost. He's terrified. He's shaking. And he knocks at my grandfather's door. My grandfather opens. He says, what's the matter? He says, I, you told us to go for that walk. I, w- I went on the walk, and I, I met somebody. He says, well, he robbed you? He says, no, no, no. He says, I met somebody I've never met before. I have no idea who this person is. He says, I met myself. My whole life I've been living with a certain understanding of this is who I am. This is, a, this is what I need to show for my friends, and this is what I need to show for my neighbors. And we build this whole persona of who we are hiding the real true me. He says, now I was alone. I was out in the open. It was just me. And I realized I'm a total stranger to myself. I'm a total different person than what I thought I was. I never, I never looked at myself as being angry. And suddenly I see I'm an angry person. All that I would criticize all those people. Look at them. They're so angry. They have a bad temper. It's really me. Right? The Talmud tells us that kol ha posel bemumo posel. When you're seeing the negative of another person, essentially you're seeing the negative of your own self. We mentioned this last week. You're seeing your own flaw. So we don't we don't identify just like oh that person is terrible and that person is terrible and this one is doing something wrong and this one right it's really our own flaws. It's a great thing if you can take all those negative things that you see in other people and then sit by yourself. Don't ask anyone else. Sit by yourself quietly in a room with no phone and no radio, no television and no internet and just introspect. Maybe maybe I have some of these traits. Maybe, maybe that's really me. Maybe all of those people are just there. They're not even awful in their traits. They actually have great traits, but I'm seeing negative because I'm seeing my own flaws. It's really a mirror of myself. Maybe. Something something to think about. Everyone has a perfect trait. There's another very important, important piece that we need to we need to know here before we we before we start talking about traits and that is that you will be tested it's guaranteed you're going to be tested you're going to be tested you know we're going to talk about any of those traits generosity right someone's going to call you up and they're going to say you know i have this orphanage in in uh in israel i I really need your help and you just gave your donation to the synagogue and you're just you know it's like uh, i don't know i you're going to be tested. You will be tested. God will test you as soon as you start working on the trait. Suddenly you're like, oh my goodness. Now all of these tests of kindness, of all of those traits we discussed, every single one is going to come back and say and say to you, are you, are you really ready to, to take the step? Are you really to, you know, uh, truth, right? You're working on your truth. You want to make it a 10 out of 10 on truth. That you're always going to be truthful. And even when it's uncomfortable, you're going to say the truth. Even when it's embarrassing for yourself, you're going to say the truth. And then, well, I don't know. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. And it's like you're just shy out of it. And you're going to be tested on it. God is going to test us always because that's what living beings are now. I mentioned that the EKG, the way it works, is it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, right? If anybody's ever ever had a a twelve, uh, right, a, a uh, not a twelve gauge, but a <laughs> but a twelve lead. Um, so it it tells you the heart rhythm, and it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. It's amazing. Why can't it just be straight? Why can't we just have go straight? You're dead. 
right? You're going to have challenges. You're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. You're going to have ups and you're going to have downs. That is the reality of mankind, right? And every trait we're going to talk about, you're going to talk about faith. I, I happen to believe my grandfather brought that diagram that I showed you, that diamond. I showed you the first class of my own traits. I'll keep it far back so you don't look at it. You don't see my own traits, right? But this, these diamonds, these traits are, you know, my worst trait, my best trait, my the perfect positive, the perfect negative. These are the positive ones, the ones on top, and these are the negative ones, the ones here on, on the bottom. So I start uh, looking at them and saying to myself, okay, how am I, how am I going to reach a, a perfection with this? How am I going to attain this one, right? Guess what? You're going to be tested on each one of these. You're going to be tested. And there's no, there's no way out of it. There's no one who gets a free ride. It's like, oh, I'm going to work on this trait and I'm going to be perfect, right? It's, gonna be a di- it's, gonna, it's not going to be an easy ride because if you really want perfection, you're going to have to face the challenges to, you know, to really get up to the level that you need to be at. Now, I want to want to just bring you back to Adam and Noah. Remember Noah? He had the flood in his generation. And it says that Noah was a righteous person in his generation. It says that Noah was righteous in his generation. But, our commentaries say, if he was in Abraham's generation... He wouldn't have been so righteous. Why not? What did Noah do that he was righteous? And it's like, listen, when you're in high school, you're you're a big kid. But now that you're in college, you're nothing. <laughs> come on, come on, right? Why, why do you become a nothing suddenly? If he was in the generation of Abraham, he'd be in the little leagues. You're a little kid. You know, you you don't compare to Abraham. So Rashi explains the most incredible thing. He says, Ki Noach hayat sarich sad letomcho. Noach Noah needed assistance constantly. He couldn't. Noah hayat sarich saad letomcho. He needed assistance constantly. So imagine your child. You're trying to teach the child how to ride a bicycle. So you hold the back of his chair, the back of his saddle, right, and you're running along with him. He says, "Don't leave go! Don't leave go! Don't leave go! Right? Don't leave go! I can't do it." Noah said his whole life, "Just keep me with the training wheels. I'm good." Keep me with the training wheels. I don't want to ever take the next step. Abraham was able to go on his own. Abraham went on his own. Lech lecha. He was able to go. He was able to, 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 to perfect his traits. He was able to have struggles. And he was tested. We know that he was tested. He had 10 trials. Each one testing his character. Each one testing his faith. Each one testing his ability to go to the next step. Noach, no tests. He has the training wheels. He says, I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to be with the troublemakers. I'm not going to be a bad guy. But don't test me. Don't test me. That's the difference between Abraham and Noach. Abraham says, I'm in the game to win it. Take off those training wheels. I'm going to fall a few times, but I'm going to learn. I'm going to be better. Right? So kindness. You know, you know to what degree Abraham was tested on kindness. So here he has these three strangers come. When do they come? They don't come on an ordinary day. When it's they they come when, on the third day after a circumcision. When it's the most painful. When it's the most uncomfortable. And not only that. To add to that, God is sitting in the tent with him. God is visiting him, so to speak. And he says, "God, time out. All right, I got to go take care of these people here. All right, that's part of his test." And he does all of that, takes care of them, runs for them. He says, hey, come, come, let me, I'll give, you, I'll give you something to eat. I'll give you some water or some bread. What is he? He slaughters three animals for them. All of that, all unbelievable kindness, right? Does he pass the kindness test? Yes, absolutely. It was one flaw. He told his servant to go bring them the water. Go, go, go bring them the water. Right? While he's running around doing everything, he didn't do it himself. You know the punishment for that? The Jewish people, a few hundred years later in the desert, how are they going to get their water? They're not going to get their water directly. They're going to need a rock that's going to, they're going to have to hit the rock, talk to the rock, this the rock, that the rock, right? And then they'll get the water. Abraham didn't give it direct. 
his children are not going to get it direct. Well, you, you talk about the most perfect acts of kindness. One slight imperfection. Now, for us, that's perfection. But for Abraham, for who he was at his high level, he was punished in that way. Our sages tell us that the future, his great-grandchildren, when they're going to be leaving Egypt, they're going to need a messenger that bring them, brings them the water. Right? So that's that's the, 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 the caution that we need when, we, when we're talking about growth. You're throwing the ball when you're wearing your glove and you're on the field. Right? If you're at a baseball game, especially here in the Astros, right, at the at Minute Maid Park now, they have the, the nets all along the whole thing, so forget it. You're not getting a ball. But um, even if you want one, you're not getting one. Right? But generally speaking, you're sitting in the crowds. No one's throwing you a ball. But you get on the field, they start throwing you the ball. And you better be ready because it'll be coming from all sides. Batting practice, eh, throwing the ball, it's going to be coming fast. You better be ready. Right? We could be sitting in the bleachers and I'd say, I'm, I'm just on the sidelines. Leave me alone. Don't throw the ball. I'll just come. I'll be a spectator. I'm watching. Or we can get in the game and we can face those challenges. And they're going to throw a curveball at us and they're going to throw a changeup and they're going to throw a slider and a fastball. And we're, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a struggle. But that's what helps us grow. That's what helps us grow. People always ask why the challenges begin when they begin learning Musa. So I, until now, I was perfectly okay with my, with my arrogance or with my selfishness or with my, you know, God forbid, hatred or dishonesty or, or jealousy. Uh, suddenly I start learning and now it starts attacking me talk, because now you're in the game. Now you're on the field. Welcome to the game. Welcome to the major leagues. Right now you're in the game. Guess what? You're gonna start, and I, I want you. I'm inviting you all, those who are listening online, and those who are here in the classroom. Share with me your ideas. Share with me some of your you, the things that come to mind. And we're gonna start talking about the traits. Hopefully in two weeks. Next week we're still gonna do another introduction, last introduction class, and then we're going to get off off on on you know t off to the races um, in the future weeks. Um, so, I want to share one more idea, and that is that, you know, I want to share with you a parable. A parable that, what is our soul? Our soul is a gem, a gem in God's crown. God has a crown. He takes that gem, that's your soul, and he puts it in you. Now, my father was a diamond dealer for almost 30 years. And he'll tell you, any, any, any jeweler will tell you that no stone is perfect. No stone is perfect. There's a little imperfection. There's a, 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 a coloring, a shade. There's something there. If you're very careful, sometimes you can't see it to the naked eye. But if you, if you look carefully, you can see a slight imperfection here, a little line there, a little touch there. It's very, very rare that you'll ever find a perfect, perfect gem. Unless it's fake. It's very hard to find the perfect gem. So God is giving you that gem, that stone, and putting it as your soul. Those are your traits. Throughout your lifetime, you're going to have opportunities to clean and perfect that stone. And my father will tell you, and also jewelers, all jewelers will tell you, there's something called an enhancement is where they infuse the diamond with chemicals and it removes the cloudiness. It could remove all of those imperfections. That's our work in Musar. Our work in Musar is when we clean the cloudiness. The cloudiness could be a little tinge of, of laziness. It could be a little bit of lust. It could be a little bit of selfishness. Those negative traits, we want to make it sparkle, right? So that when we give that stone back at the end of our lives, God has a sparkling gem in his crown. And it's each of us. We are each a gem. Every human being, God invested in us unbelievable resources. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to reach perfection. And we have the tools 
Because if he didn't want us to reach perfection, he wouldn't put us here. God wants us to succeed. And that is our that is our mission, that is our goal. We have a few more minutes, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up with this. So there are three main rules um, that we, we started mentioning previously, but I wanna I wanna follow through with them. Number one is that the goal is not to become better, but rather to change. Don't try to reach perfection. Right now, that's not our goal. Our goal is to make change, any change, small change, very small change. Number two is that muster is not an ends. It's a means. It's a tool. Right? Someone once asked Rabbi Sorol Salanter, what should I do if I have a half a day, a half an hour a day to learn? Should I study Talmud? Should I study Mishnah? Should I study Musr? What should I study? I only have a half hour a day. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanta told him, study Musr, because if you learn it properly, you'll find that you have more than a half hour a day. Right? If, if, so that, that's another thing. I have to just, I'll step back for a second a little bit. We, we, we spoke a little bit about Musr. We have to understand that there's two elements of Musr. Number one is the study of Musr, which we're doing now. And then there's the work of Musr. There's the study and the work, right? I can tell you how to fix a computer, but that doesn't mean you know how to. You can go to a class and you can see the videos about it and you can even take the test and pass it. And you get to the computer like, um, what do I do, right? So it, it, with the works of our traits, there's the learning of Musar, which helps put us in the right direction, the res- right frame of mind. But then there's the actual work. You know, when someone says something that irritates us, how are we going to overcome it out in the field? How are we going to change it at that moment? It's a totally different set of skills. Right? We're going to work on both of them. And the, sec- the third rule is that Musser is not a quick fix or a three-step easy program. Just pay forty nine dollars, and in thirty days you'll lose forty pounds. No, that does that doesn't work. Okay, that doesn't work in Musser. In Musser, it's a long process. You plant the seed, then the flowers grow over time. Right? Imagine that you plant the seed, and my children, right? They come, they do these prog- projects in school, especially before Tu B'Shvat. They're planting trees, and it's like you know, it's, it's really it's really cute. They come home with this little cup with some with some uh, dirt in there, and you're like, well, what's that? Like, it's going to be a tree, right? And you're like, okay. So then you see this little bud coming out. They come every day home from school. They're like, oh, did it? They, and you see that little bud come out. And you're like, oh, that's great. There's a bud. I want to make this into a tree. Let me pull it out. And now we're going to make, or what's going to happen? It dies. Why? It has to grow organically. It has to take its own. It has to strengthen its, its roots, right? It needs to get the proper nourishment. And then that little, little bud becomes a beautiful flower, Right? And then from there, it keeps on growing and growing, hopefully. Right? A tree is the same exact thing. A human being is the same exact thing. You can't say, oh, I see a little bit of change. Now let's go. Right? It's like you try to imagine if you try to make your child, a four-year-old child, you know, to, to uh, speak with or to act in a certain way. You bring, them, you bring them to synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. You want them to, to experience it. Right? So you bring them to Rosh Hashanah. You're like, I want you to sit here and don't make a sound, okay? It's going to be four or five hours of services, and you expect them to be quiet. They're a healthy child. Let them run around. Don't, or don't bring them. Or bring them for 10 minutes. All right? My children, I bring them into the synagogue. I tell them, I want you to just say the Shema and get out. I can't stay? No, leave. Right? Because I don't want it to become cumbersome for them. I don't want it to be challenging for them. I want it to be an enjoyable experience. Come, enjoy it. And go. Okay, I'm not endorsing or saying what to do, or, you know, but I'm just <laughs> the idea, the concept of that we can't expect change to happen like that. You plant the seed, you water it, you do everything, give it all the nourishment it needs, and then it will grow a beautiful, blossoming fruit. Okay, so just some useful first steps of Musar. Number one is who am I right now? Every person has positive and negative traits we mentioned. Don't compare yourself to anyone. Don't compare yourself to anyone. You're judged 
only according to your own abilities. You're only going to be judged according to your own abilities. You're not going to be judged why didn't you do what your neighbor did. Right? Let me ask you a question. Um, you find out that there's someone who gave a $1,000 donation to the synagogue. You're like, wow, first-time gift. They're young. It's incredible. Right? And then you find out that's, that that's really their, their gift for the year. It's, they gave it all to the synagogue. Wow, that's amazing. And then you find out it's Mark Zuckerberg, right? Who's worth $250 billion or whatever, however many billion dollars. That's it? That's it? So you're 35 years old. Who cares? That's it? Right? So for one person, it's like, wow, he saved up all this money. And this person is 12 years old. That's amazing. That's amazing. They saved up $1,000 to give to the synagogue. That's beautiful. But you take that same $1,000 and you apply it to someone else. It's like, what's that? That's nothing. $1,000? That's like, that's like a penny for someone else, right? The idea is that you're trying to compare. You can't compare to other people. You look to one person, their kindness at their level, they are a billionaire in kindness. So doing that act of kindness may be nothing. But for another person, it might be their whole life that they're giving up for this kindness. So you have to be very, very careful trying to compare yourself to someone else. Number one, what are my traits? What are my strengths and weaknesses? And how do I rate myself with my specific traits? And that's a sheet that we gave out. Again, anybody who wants this understanding myself worksheet, I'll happily email it to you. You can uh, email me at awolbe at torchweb.org. It's A-W-O-L-B-E at T-O-R-C-H-W-E-B dot O-R-G. Um, and I'll happily uh, email it to you. Where do I want to go is the next question. What do I want to become? What is my own mission statement? What is my own mission statement? What does my creator expect me to accomplish with the skills and talents he bestowed within me? He gave me a whole beautiful uh, artillery. He gave me all of these tools to accomplish what I need to accomplish. What does he want from me? And then, this is something that we're going to work on later, is to write our own mission statement. Right? Our own personal mission statement. What is my goal in my life? What do I want to accomplish? And you know, if you walk into Starbucks, usually they should have. On top, they have a mission statement. And it's to make humanity smile through coffee, one cup at a time, right? And they, they, the donuts is the same thing. You go to Krispy Kreme, it's to make humanity happy, one donut at a time, right? Or something like that. What is our mission statement, our personal mission statement? We're not trying to sell donuts. We're not trying to sell coffee. We're trying to change our lives. We have to set a mission statement. And we'll talk about that, God willing, next week. Uh, next week, I don't know if there's class next week because it's Era versus Shoshana, right? So you can cut already. Um, so I wa want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for listening. And don't forget, you can find these podcasts, The Muslim Podcast, on iTunes and Google Podcast and uh, everywhere else. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening. Now,